Now that the creative fire has been ignited and our dancer has danced, let's have a taste of the real stuff. As soon as natural language is given a technical job to do, it is in a position to develop a technical vocabulary. And it generally does so. What is remarkable about Indian culture is that the first technical or semi-technical vocabulary appears to have developed in the Rig Veda in order to express matters which are concerned with the composition of the Rig Veda itself. Concepts relating to language, composition, poetic creation, verbalization, linguistic expression, inspiration, illumination, vision, etc., are elaborated and expressed by a large number of special terms, which may often be called semi-technical or technical. Roughly at the same time, and often in close relation with this vocabulary of sacred composition, the ritual vocabulary begins to develop. Though there is no abnormal increase in metalinguistic terms, beyond what is available to any well-developed natural language, there is in both of these types of vocabulary a special feature which may be characterized as metalinguistic. And let's take some time to elaborate on this special feature which Stahl calls metalinguistic. Recall from last lecture that Heidegger spoke of mnemosyne, mother of the muses, and described her as the thinking back to what is to be thought and the source and ground of poesy. He further elaborates on this idea, stating, This is why poesy is the water, that at times flows backward towards the source, towards thinking as a thinking back, a recollection. Poetry wells up only from the devoted thought thinking back, recollecting. Thus, Heidegger here gives us a glimpse of the poetic process by equating poesy with water imagery. The journey by which the recollection possesses for us the coveted drops as voice for our pawns. But more literally, this recollection will manifest for us the journey of the Logos, its pains and punishments, and its ultimate divination. Now the role of poetry in swelling up the Logos, from ground up, will have to be developed later. And whether this Logos culminates in history or in myth, daughters of Mnemosyne, is a task we'll explore with the help of Michael Witzel. 
Again, we are naming with respect to the etymology, not any particular system of knowledge. So when we say logos or myth, we need not bear with us anything other than the verb roots. Elsewhere Heidegger writes, if all art is in essence poetry, then the arts of architecture, painting, sculpture, and music must be traced back to poesy, i.e. making. Nevertheless, the linguistic work, the poem, in this narrower sense, has a privileged position in the domain of the arts. Language, or speech, is not poetry because it is the primal poesy. Rather, poesy takes place in language because language preserves the original nature of poetry. And if mnemosyne is the ground of poesy, the wellspring from which pours poetry, then for Heidegger, speech preserves the original nature of poetry because its essence preserves this act of pouring sounds. Preserving the vital act of Brahma, vivaciously pouring from his lotus mouth the resounding sounds. O mata to brahmajitnyasa. I want to take on the imagery that Heidegger presents to us here about poetry and see what he's really on about. First, let us recall the etymology of the word poetry. We saw that it comes from a root carrying the sense to make, build, pile up, perceive, pay, fine, compensate, and in a sense reciprocate. And it gave us the Sanskrit word jitta. And it preserves a sense of artisanship, something arranged, piled up, and collected. And indeed, this is how we speak about poetry and poems today. Something articulate, well-made, and constructed or put together by artistic minds. I take Heidegger here to be preserving an intuition that is shared too by Mueller. We saw in the first lecture that Mueller reserves the noun mind and the verb to think for all that is going on within us, whether sensation, perception, conception, or naming. Memory was coupled to this act of thinking by being ascribed the role of expressing a partial permanence in opposition to oblivescence or forgetting. But Heidegger goes much farther than Mueller here and preserves more ancient voices of the grove. Poesy, or the act of making, underlies poetry, and the recursive nature or reciprocal back and forthing of mnemosyne is its ground. And thus the various arts, architecture, painting, music, sculpture, and speech, can be traced back to this original poesy, keeping with our sense that the arts are all poetic in the service of worship. Note here that all this talk about poetry is happening in speech, a little bit less poetically than what the Brahmins would have us do. And Heidegger would like to give special status to the poem among the arts for its ability to speak truth. Now the reason he believes this to be the case is because language preserves making sense, and thus can birth for us poems. Now why the poem has a privileged position in the domain of the arts is something we can only begin to appreciate when we begin examining the hymns of the Rig Veda. When looking at language from beyond speech, it can force us to recognize how incomplete our storehouse of names of being can be especially when we notice how much the various categories of arts overlap. Music has rhythm, order, and harmony, as do poems. But poems are peculiar, since they manifest an architecture that can simultaneously invoke many levels of imagery, thus painting for us a picture beyond the words which are contained in them. And this observation typically extends the definition of language beyond mere speech. And often we're left to decide whether we really just mean the arts when we say language. For example, we fail to decide on the role of bodily gestures and dance in poetry. Dance must be a kind of art form, or it very well might be the root of all the harmonies which find themselves expressed in poetry and art. Perhaps by this fact we could argue that poesy is a sophisticated dance performance. This appeal to verbs as the foundation is certainly within the spirit of Heideggerian thought, but we'll have to come back to it equipped with more etymology. 
Perhaps some words of consolidation from Mr. Heidegger before we delve into the abyss. We forsake up the Stephen of being to hear. Now, this is definitely a cryptic sounding message, so let's invoke the imagery of the words he used to elucidate what he might have his mind fixed upon. Stimme, meaning voice, comes from the root carrying the sense of mouth and muzzle. And it is from this root we obtain the Greek word stoma, a mouth or a source of a river, a fissure in earth, or the frontmost part of something. And in English we get the word Stephen, a voice, a request, a petition, a prayer, or a command. Recalling from the previous lecture, we can invoke the image of our syllable, with the voice in the middle, accompanied by the consonants. So to foreseek the source of the river of being is certainly a noble task for prophets, for seeking to become prophets of the grove, climbing up the mound to reach its peak, the mouth of the spring that wells up as poetry. The second word of interest here is huren, to hear. It comes from two roots, the first bearing the sense to see and perceive, and this gives us the Sanskrit avis, meaning before the eyes, or evidently. It gives us the English word audio, meaning to hear, listen, obey, understand, and attend. And it is from this root that we get the word ear. And we can combine this root with another root, which bears the sense of being sharp, thus sharp-eared, which gives us the word acute, and the word huren, and the word hear. Now the association of the verb to see with that of the verb to hear is significant when taming the imagery of sacred poetics, something we'll only appreciate once we reach the peak of the mound. Now returning to Heidegger, to forsake up by being sharp-eared, to obey the voice, request, petition, prayer, or command, perhaps a devoted thought thinking back, is certainly rich in religious imagery. And now sitting in the presence of the Rig Vedic poets, Heidegger certainly is partaking in the rhythms of their drums. Now this isn't the first time thinkers have invoked the relationship between etymology and imagery. Paul Thiem popularized the term Sprachmalerei, meaning language painting, to call to attention this very relationship. In a now famous article he wrote, it is to be expected from the outset that the artistic as well as the experiential language of the Vedic poets will offer examples of symbolic Sprachmalerei, language painting. In fact, it is this language which first attracted my interest to the phenomena and from which it first became clear to me as a principle that can be used for an exhaustive interpretation. Much like how the imagery hidden behind words like Huren and Stimme allow for the structure of the syllable to explain the obtuse poetics, Paul noted, as many others have, that names appear to preserve an underlying image with its architecture. Now, coupling sense and imagination is achieved through the integration of verb roots and imagery, that is, with verbs and our imagination. And in the lectures that follow, we'll analyze this architecture as we study the hymns of the Rig Veda and how they ingeniously capture the imagery of the sacred ritual. As Stahl writes, Renaud and Gonda, among others, have studied the vocabulary of sacred composition in the Rig Veda. While Renaud tends to regard these special usages of terms and these special derivatives as metaphors and images, as they may well have been originally, we should be on our guard against exclusively poetic interpretation. The poets of the Rig Veda were also seers, sages, and spiritual leaders of the tribe or community. This special vocabulary is better regarded as technical or semi-technical, terms which are not only more neutral, but which also convey that the expressions thus characterized appear to have been used primarily by specialists, and not by every user of the ordinary Vedic speech. 
Now, since we're not yet exploring historical aspects of our system of language, we'll return to that later when we trace the Indo-Europeans, I will liberally explore the poetic interpretations in the lectures that follow. I sometimes find that scholars seeking to historicize the poetics tend to reduce them to history, one of the daughters of mnemosyne. And since archetypes are extremely useful for completing narratives, the risk of anachronism is extremely high. It's simply better for us to first develop our vocabularies and etymologies before seeking to interpret sociological or economic interpretations. Recall how a few lectures back we invoked for ourselves the image of the untamed beast huffing and puffing irrelevancies to bring down our houses. The Sprachmererei used by the artists invoked imagery of danger and war with words like spirit, beast, atman, wolf, wild, warm, furnace, thermal, gore, offend, defend, bane, and manifesto. This method of spoken painting is an ancient one, and as we shall see shortly, was operative in the formulations of the hymns of the Rigveda to preserve the ritual imagery. Most importantly, etymology remains the most powerful method by which this art form has been employed. While the reader is referred to the works of Renault and Gonda for fuller detail, a few examples of these special terms and usages will be given here. Many such terms are derived from the root di and tia, which express poetic inspiration and intuition of the seers, leading to the composition of the hymns. Thus, manasa di means to see with the mind. Dhya means through inspiration or intuition. Dhira refers to the inspired poets or sages, and Dhiti to their materialized visions, the hymns. The language which is manifest in the Rigveda is referred to by many terms, Vach, Mati, Vani. Special reverence is reserved for the goddess of speech, Saraswati. Renaud translates Meda as the poetic faculty. Another term for inspired and endowed with perceptiveness, also happily inebriated, is Madha, from which we also have Sadamada, symposium. The inspired state results in trembling or vibration, expressed by the root vip, from which we have the later term vipra, a Brahmin, not to mention our contemporary vibes. We'll return to these roots and acquaint ourselves with their details in the preceding lectures. But to get a flavor of what to expect, let's draw our attention to the root vip, bearing the sense to shake, tremble, agitate, swing away, to turn, wind, and rotate. As Stahl reminded us, we get our English words vibe and wipe from this root. And in Sanskrit, we get the root vip, to throw, cast, tremble, shake, shiver, vibrate, quiver, be stirred. And the noun vipra, stirred or excited, inspired, quivering, twinkling, and wise. Now this agitation brings to our mind the imagery of the jitta, but in keeping with the devices of the poets, we can place next to this root another familiar root, vid, from which we get the words wise and video, and the Sanskrit root vid, to know and find. Now on the surface level, there is no connection between these two roots, but we saw that vipra means wise, thereby linking these two semantically. And we also know that by changing the final consonant of this root from ved to vip, that is, the d to a p, allows us to swing back and forth between the vedas and the vipras. Now this is known as sound symbolism, and as we will see, it is employed liberally in the poetics of the Rig Veda. And most importantly, paying attention to these sound manipulations will become important when keeping track of the imagery and the relations between images that the poets might have in mind. For as Heidegger has already reminded us, to couple seeing and hearing is much coveted by the members of the grove, and the Rig Vedic poets are not shy in making such a claim. A more clearly metaphorical use is found in Arka, 
meaning light, which also means chant, for the underlying thought is conceived of as light. And some of the apparent fanciful interpretations of Sri Aurobindo are confirmed by Renault. The root thup expresses the sparking or burning of the sacred verse. Arka here is a word that demonstrates the metalinguistic use of light as chant, or something heard. The coupling of the sounds of chants with the sight of light is a good demonstration of Sprach Melarai in action. And since Stahl here has invoked the name of Sri Aurobindo, it's only appropriate that we finish our painting with his words of wisdom. As he writes, I seek a light that shall be new yet old, the oldest indeed of all lights. I seek not science, not religion, nor theosophy, but Veda, the truth about Brahman, not only about his essentiality, but about his manifestation. Not a lamp on the way to the forest, but a light and a guide to joy and action in the world. The Veda was the beginning of our spiritual knowledge. The Veda will remain its end. These compositions of an unknown antiquity are as the many breasts of the eternal mother of knowledge from which our succeeding ages have all been fed. The recovery of the perfect truth of the Veda is therefore not merely a desiredum for our modern intellectual curiosity, but a practical necessity for the future of the human race. Now I take Aurobindo here to be calling for the re-establishment of the poetic tradition of the Rishis, and the ascetics of the grove will answer. But note here how even Aurobindo, in his use of poetic imagery, is invoking the relation between sound and light. The word arka comes from the root bearing the sense to praise and to shine, again simultaneously visual and auditory, and gives us the Sanskrit root archa, bearing the same sense. This root gives us the Sanskrit word arka, a flash of lightning, a hymn or a chant, and archi, a ray or flame. But we can also change the grade of the initial vowel of this root, from ar to r and get another root, rich, meaning to praise, or verse. This root gives us the word rikva, meaning praising or jubilant with praise, and it is the initial word of the compound word rikveda, which I'll take the liberty here to translate as the wisdom of the flame. Similarly, the root ars bears the sense to flow and pour, and gives us the Sanskrit arsh, meaning to gush forth, to flow swiftly, or to rush forth. And via the sound change, the root rish, to pour out praises in the form of a hymn. And the latter of these roots gives us the word rishi, a seer, a sage, or a participant in a rite who pours out praises in the form of a hymn. It is no coincidence that arch and arsh are coupled poetically to produce the imagery of shining light being spoken from the mouth of the enlightened ones. And here again, it is etymology that allows us to keep track of the sprach melerai, so we don't lose track of the greater ritual imagery that is being preserved by language itself. As we'll see shortly, when the symbolism takes over and roots are associated with other roots to depict the ritual imagery, things can get very confusing. But if we know our etymology, we'll never be lost. Composing sacred language is also referred to as constructing, taksh, and weaving, tantu, and is compared to the milking of cows, imagery which we also saw was invoked by Aurobindo when he referred to the breasts of the eternal mother of knowledge. The ideas which the inspired seer receives are called kratu, Various ideas and terms are derived from the root pu, filtering. In the activity of the verbal creation, thought and language are filtered, just as the soma juice is filtered in the ritual. This filtering is a purification, which brings the sacred powers of language to the surface. And it is this organizing of language, the poesy, according to the soma ritual imagery, that marks sacred poetics from those of mundane ruminations. We saw the word bhavaka, or a passive or neuter form of fire, in a previous lecture when speaking of the semantic opposition to the dynamic and masculine word agni, 
The word comes from the root bearing a sense to clean and purify, giving us the Sanskrit root pu, to purify and cleanse, from which we can derive the words bhavana, holy or purifying, bhavaka, pyre and fire, bhava, purification, and pavitra, pure. Thus combining the pouring gesture of the rishi and the purification of flames, we have invoked with our sprach melerai the images shown here. Composing sacred language is no simple task and has acquired the reputation of being the most difficult puzzles of the entire modern academy. We can keep with the etymology of the word sacred and refer to sacred language as the sacrificial language of the gods. Now the Brahmins called this sacrificial language Brahman. That is to say, the knowers of Brahman are Brahmin. For why else would we call Brahma a Brahmin? And naturally, we can ask ourselves here, in the same spirit of the warrior Arjuna, Arjuna Uvacha, Kimtad Brahma. What is Brahman? The etymological root for the word Brahma bears the sense to rise, be high, and be lofty, a mound, a hill, and a mountain. Again, the latter of these senses, hills and mounds and mountains, emerging from the verbs to rise and be high, preserving for us the imagery of the syllable. In English, this root gives us the words bury, bury, burrow, fort, force, effort, and not surprisingly, the word pour, which reminds us again here of Brahma pouring Brahman. We get the Sanskrit root br, meaning to grow, increase, expand, and emit, to be thick, to grow great or strong, from which we get the Sanskrit babrahana, to be elevated, brihas, a prayer, devotion, a song, brahma, here I'll translate as the pourer, and brahman, the sacrificial formulas. Recalling here the fact that the word rishi came from a root bearing the sense to flow and to pour, we find again preserved the imagery of the sacrificial formulas flowing from the mouth of the rishi into the altar, the vessel. And since Arjuna the warrior had asked a question, the answer which poured from the mouth of Yogeshwara himself was, Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Aksharam Brahma Paramam. Brahman is the imperishable stranger. Now let's try to figure out what that means. The first of these words, akshara, comes from a root bearing the sense to flow away, and from which we get the Greek word ptero, meaning to destroy, ruin, spoil, and corrupt. In Sanskrit, we get the root kshar, to flow, melt, and perish, and the verb ksharati, to flow, stream, trickle, melt away, perish, wane, and disappear, and kshara, melt, perishable, ephemeral, destructible. By negating this verb with the negation particle, we get the word akshara, which preserves this sense of being imperishable. But akshara, as we were just told by Arjuna's master, is Brahman, the elevated force from the divine pourer. Thus we are not surprised to find the imagery of the mound invoked by the word akshara, and finding Brahman equated with it. Brahman is therefore the imperishable syllable, a seizing or taking hold together that persists and is incorruptible, since it doesn't melt away with the flow. Because it is sustained, by the eternal pouring of Brahma. Now, speaking of persistence, the final word, paramam, comes from a root bearing the sense of before, in front, and first. The root gives us the English words praise, prize, and persist, that is, to stand before, to endure, to last, and remain in battle. We get a derived root, which means toward or leading from which we get the Greek word promos, meaning foremost, champion, prime, and chief leader. If we add to this root our familiar root min, 
to think, to form of thought, to put in mind, to tower and mountain, we get the Greek word promethis, forethinking or having forethought, from which we then get the English word Prometheus. We also get the English word pariah, a wild thing, something untamed or an outcast. And in Sanskrit, we get the word para, remoteness, the highest point or peak, a foe, an adversary, an opponent, or a stranger. And parama then is the highest, supreme, or ultimate, at the peak of the mound. By keeping these three words in mind, we can say that the dispenser of radiance reminded Arjuna that Brahman is this imperishable stranger standing atop the syllable mound. Again, we see here how words are being employed in the Bhagavad Gita, which are preserving an underlying sacrificial image. And it is for this reason the Brahmins consider the Gita Brahman, the fifth Veda. This yoking together of verb imagery with sound is characteristic of metalinguistics and is what we shall call Brahman, and it is employed liberally throughout the Vedas. For example, later Krishna tells Arjuna, Om Ityekaksharam Brahma. Om, this one syllable, is Brahma, that which is poured from the mouth of Brahma, the Rishi. We get the word Brihat, meaning large, great, big, bulky, lofty, tall, mighty, strong, clear, and loud, as a derivative of the root brih. Recall from last lecture on sonority, the middle of the syllable, where the swelling force is predominant and the loudest, we gave it the name a vowel. And the root for the word vowel also gave us the Sanskrit word ukta, from which we derive vach, divine speech. Now, staying grounded by coupling both imagery and sound is certainly a form of zugmatography. And when we read the hymns of the rishis, this coupling is a prerequisite when doing any and all interpretations. To demonstrate this coupling in action, let me share with you a verse from the Rig Veda. Stephanie Jameson and Joel Brereton in their translation of the Rig Veda observe that in one of the hymns of the 10th chapter, Rishi Brihadukta Vama Devya uses his own name in a poetic device. The verse states, Adapriyam shusham indraya manma brahma krito brihaddukta davachi. So, a dear fortifying thought has been spoken to Indra from brihadukta, the crafter of sacred formulations. The first thing to note here is that the verse begins with the word adha, which is used like atha as an inceptive particle indicating a commencement. Another point we can note here is the invocation of a fortifying thought as manma, which we know comes from the root that preserves the meaning of the middle. Now, as Jameson and Brereton put it, in the very last pada of the hymn, the poet seems to be doing something similar with his own name, Brihadukta, having or producing lofty speech. As Jess Lundquist has suggested to me, via personal communication, the pada reads Brahmakrito Brihadukta Davachi, having been spoken from Brihadukta, the crafter of sacred formulations, with his name positioned between the other two words in the line. The first half of his name, Brihat, is a close phonological match to the first half of the word Brahma, sacred formulation. The last half of his name, Ukta, meaning solemn speech, is etymologically related to the verb Avachi. Thus his very name can be, as it were, transformed into the verbal products that are his reason for being. So Brihadukta, a manma in the middle, demonstrates the recursive absorption of his name back into the eternal Brahman. And having begun the verse with Adha, we can say that his reason for being in the middle was to embody the eternal act of Brahma, a rishi pouring from his mouth the Brahman, bestowing being a force by sweating with fervor. This observation also highlights an important claim, that the composers of these hymns knew their etymology and grammar to an incredible extent. It is hard for me to accept that grammar and etymology were later innovations designed to interpret a forgotten past. 
the command of language that's displayed in these hymns, as demonstrated by countless poetic devices, is what facilitates hearing the Veda while seeing its video. The theme of inspired speech as forming of mound, as it is being poured into the vessel of the sage, is again captured by poetics of a verse that plays with the etymology of the word aksharam. Tasyaha samudra adivikshanti tena jivanti pradishashchatasraha tatakshati aksharam tad vishvam upajivati. Seas flow everywhere from her, the buffalo cow, speech. By that the four directions live. From that the syllable flows. Upon that does everything live. As Stephanie and Joel comment here, the theme of inspired speech, vach, is taken up again by verse 36 to 42 of this hymn. It is introduced in verses 36 and 37, in which the poet shifts attention to the ancient rishis, whose insights and thought are brought into the present by the poet. However, the poet does not understand his own inspiration which is finally a gift of the gods, or more specifically, a gift of Agni. According to verses 39 to 42, this inspired speech descends to the human realm like water in order to sustain life on earth. While the emphasis in the verse is on speech as a cosmic principle and human possession, a specific ritual reference is not far away. As Geldner observes, verse 40 accompanies a verse in the Atharva Veda a hymn to the Garma drink of the Pravargya rite. Here we see the formulation of the phrase tatakshadati aksharam, which plays with the root kshar as the verb kshadati and the noun aksharam, giving us the sense of an imperishable flow, one that is potent and charged with the force that sustains the poet's imagination. Like poets drinking from Namasani, the flowing river of memory, the syllable will play the role of what Van Bidenen described as the principle of continuity to which everything can be reduced and from which everything can be derived. Now, regarding the ritual reference of the Pravargya, we'll return to it when we study the imagery associated with ritual rites of passage which divinize boys and make them into men. For now, it's sufficient to appreciate how the language of the Veda preserves a broader system of ritual imagery with wordplay which we can now keep track of using etymology. To the seers or poets of the Rig Veda, the creation of the hymns was more than a simple exercise in versification. It was a sacred activity which could only be brought to successful completion through the close collaboration between intimate associates or friends who were initiated in the sacred art and became its guardians. Moreover, this activity was especially effective when supported by the ritual acts performed in the sacrifice, and when aided by the hallucinogenic soma. Now I thought I'd point out here that there is a verse in the Rig Veda that explicitly links the soma to a drink. But not only a drink, as the verse reads, a man thinks he has drunk the soma when they crush the plant. But the soma the formulators know, no one at all consumes that. Through this creative activity, the hidden powers of language become manifest, and a bond was contracted between the participants who became its keepers. Some were naturally gifted with this inspiration of sacred language. Others were excluded from it. An element of rivalry was introduced, and contests were established. A communal channeling of inspiration, which led to the discovery and creation of sacred language, was in all respects a highly special enterprise. Now speaking of a highly special enterprise, let's dig a little deeper into the sacred art and see if we can visualize what stall means by Brahman being a sacred creative activity. Recall from earlier, we translated Paramam in Aksharam Brahma Paramam as the imperishable stranger. I want to take up this imagery of the stranger to demonstrate how we keep track of multiple layers of semantics while making sense for our imaginations. Let's begin with the first verse of the last hymn of the Rig Sanghita. Rishi Samvanana here praises Agni, Sam Samid Yuvase Vrashan Agne Vishvanyarya A, Ilaspade Samid Yase Sanova Sunya Bhara. 
Over and over, O Agni, you bull, you wrest together all things from the stranger. You are kindled in the footstep of refreshment. Bring goods here to us. Jameson and Brereton comment on this verse by stating, The hymn begins, the first verse, with the ritual fire, which brings all the adya together, including those who don't seem to want it. And it is the most visible representation of the underlying unity of their ritual praxis. There is an implicit warning in this verse. The ritual fire will appropriate the goods of any holdouts. So let's develop this idea of the stranger, the adya. The word adya comes from a root carrying the sense to be fit, suitable, proper, adept, to fix, put together, and slot, and captures the imagery of a well-trained initiate pronouncing a well-formed ritual formula in order to praise the gods that are present at the ritual, which is captured by the Sanskrit word adyanti. As we saw earlier, Brihad Ukta, the Arya in the middle, had spoke as the crafter of sacred formulations, Brahmakrito Avachi. His praise was but the embodiment of the stranger. Thus we get a sense that the stranger is one who has been initiated into the sacred ritual and participates in the rivalry and contests, which Stahl alludes to here, to produce the most cryptic hymns at the sacrifice of the gods. But we can go further and examine how the Sanskrit grammarians constructed the word Arya to preserve these semantics. First, the root of the word Arya is R, and the Datupat tells us that it carries the sense of Gatau, meaning to go and move. The word Gatau comes from the root Gum, which comes from an Indo-European root that gives us the English word come, and it means to go or step. Thus we can sense here that R Gatau captures a coming and going movement. Bananis Ashtadhyayi tells us that Arya is irregularly formed when it means master or Vesya. And so if we take upon the root R and carry out the grammatical operations, we're left with the word Arya, which I will tentatively translate here as hero primarily to denote the coming and going which characterizes his journey. This hero further captures the intuition of Jameson and Brereton regarding the importance of Agni in bringing all the Arya together to establish an underlying unity of their ritual praxis. The sense of Arya as hero is even preserved in the word fit, which in Middle English meant an adversary of equal power. So to be fit is to be fit for the journey, fit for the coming and going to and from the grove, fit to bring back for us the goods. With this Sprachmelerai, we are not far off from translating Arya as the stranger. Karl Geldner bestowed upon Arya the ranks of the champion, translating it as Lord of Rank, a rich patron, a wielder of power, a rival, a great enemy, or a rich show-off. And Paul Thiem took on these intuitions and gave Adia the sense of fremde, wild, strange, unusual, and out of the ordinary, words that certainly describe heroes and champions. But Paul also gives Adia the sense of fremdling, a kind of outsider, foreigner, who is not a clansman. Now this strikes us as something strange indeed, since Bonini too says that Adya is irregularly formed when it means Veshya, a clansman, meaning that the sense of Adya goes beyond clans, tribes, and regional references. But this liberating of Adya from state politics does not mean that the stranger is an apolitical term. If anything, it becomes the site of all politics. Let me show you. Arya was described by Thiem as Fremdling Beschutzende, the protective stranger. So let's develop this imagery a bit further. Now I must warn you, what follows might get overwhelming, because we will be invoking terminology without proper knowledge of their etymologies. So I'd highly recommend at this stage to become comfortable with how we keep track of imagery when navigating Brahman. 
Again, beginning with the root r, which comes from a root meaning to pronounce a well-formed ritual formula, and the meaning gato, which we saw came from the root gum that gave us our English word come, we saw that r gives us the word aria, our hero. Bonanin reminded us that Arya is irregularly formed when it means Swami, master of oneself, cows, or property, and Veshya. Now the word Veshya comes from the root Vish, meaning to pervade, settle upon soil, or to enter into. And from this root, we get Vish, meaning clan, Vishva, all clans, Veshvanara, belonging to all clansmen, and Veshya, from the clan. Now in the hymn to Agni, we saw that the word Vishvani, which comes from this root Vish, is used next to the word Arya. We can say to Rishi Samvanana, well played good sir. But he is far more clever than just invoking Arya and Vish simultaneously. In the second verse, he invokes for us the root Vas, in Vasuni. Now the root Vas means to shine, dawn, to light up, to dwell, stay, and abide, or to clothe, dress, and wear. And from this we get the root Ush, meaning to burn, consume, punish, chastise, kill, and injure, from which we get the word Ushas, which is the name of dawn, the twilight, and the word Usra, meaning morning light, daybreak, or brightness, from which we get another word, usra, meaning ruddy red cows, bulls, and light rays. Now invoking ushas here is no coincidence, as the word arya, when used as a feminine noun, means our lady, dawn. As Rishi Kakshivant invokes for us in one of his hymns, up from the dark has arisen the lady of extensive power being attentive to the human dwelling place. Now as we delve deeper into Brahman, we're going to notice that dawn appears again and again in many guises. And that if you are ever lost in the chants, it is she who assists men to become found. I mean, she is attentive to the human dwelling place after all. And another point of interest here is the association of Adya and the twilight and both of these with medicine or therapy, captured by the word chikitsanti, which comes from our now familiar root kwe, which gave us the words poetry, pain, punish, and chitta. Chikitsanti is an extension of chitta, and it means medicine or therapy. Thus the stranger is not merely a hero in the eyes of kings, but is too the medicine man and the therapist associated with the twilight. And this imagery is certainly captured by the use of the word Krishna, which comes from the root ker, bearing the sense of an army, giving us the Greek korios, war, troops, and Krishna, meaning black, dark, dusky, and dark blue. That is, Krishna is our black hunter. Now we'll come back to this imagery of dawn emerging from Krishna in the next slide. Thus Arya, our protective stranger and hero, knows how to work with Agni to move back and forth between the human dwelling place and the twilight zone. And more locally here, the Arya, as guardian of the sacred activity of formulating Brahman, knows how to navigate back and forth between the mortals and the immortals. Now perhaps as a gem, since we've come this far, we can take from this union between language and imagery the fact that Arya also means Ishvara, as per the Nigantu. And if we reduplicate the root gum, we get the word jagat, which means moving or world. Thus, in combination with rgatau, it preserves for us jagadisha, master of motion. Later, we will begin studying some of the myths lurking behind these hymns, and we will find that juxtaposing the root vas, which gives us vasishta, and the root vish, which gives us vishvamitra, will invoke the eternal battle between kings and priests, seeking to gain access to the grove, fighting over dawn, the divine cow, whose milk bestows flames and light rays that paint insightful images 
most desired by the Adya. Perhaps to solidify the link between the twilight and the stranger, we can invoke for ourselves the Sanskrit root vr, which comes from a root meaning to watch, keep guard, cover, notice, and heed, and it gives us the English word aware. And from this root, we get a plethora of Sanskrit words preserving midspace or twilight imagery. In Sanskrit, we get the roots varuna, the all-encompasser, avrata, a vow, law, or rule, vritra, the enveloper, and through sound change, we get uru, a thigh, or being wide, from which we further derive words like urukrama, wide striding step, or urvashi, the wide extending one, that is, dawn. An important word derived from this root is vratya, the ascetic, that is, our stranger. Now the vratya will later be our guide through the grove, but before we can bestow upon him such an authority, I'd like to invoke a hymn from the Atharva Veda which has already given the Vratya such supreme authority, in which it states, Atove Brahma Chakshatram Chodatishtatam. From him, the Vratya, arose the Brahman and the Kshatra, which means sovereignty or dominion, coming from a root meaning to take by hand, to receive, and to obtain. Here we find Brahman, the ritual formula, being said to have arisen from the Vratya, the ascetic alongside the kshatra. Now to give such authority to the ascetic is not mere wordplay here, but as we will see, an expectation that applies to all ritual initiates seeking to pour speech into the sacred altar. If Agni is to wrest together all things from the stranger, an adversary of equal power, then the ascetic, who knows how to tame Agni, shall be our sovereign. As we further develop our vocabularies and intuitions, statements from hymns will further aid us in organizing our semantics. It is no coincidence here that the battle between the hero and the serpent, Vritra, which occurs in the wide extending region, the midspace, has been preserved with words deriving from the root Vr. Now whether a Vrata is prescribed by Varuna or by the Vratya, it is certain that the ultimate aim of awareness is the ascetic toiling away in the grove. So to summarize our imagery of the Adya, we can even invoke for ourselves words in English that share the same root, such as harmony, order, aristocrat, arithmetic, articulate, artist, artisan, arm, ratio, rational, reason, rhyme, and right. Thus we could say in the most literal sense, that Adya is an aristocrat, an artist, and an articulate artisan, creating harmony and order with rights, rhymes, reasons, and ratios. And having invoked medicine and therapy with poets and chikitsa, it is no strange thing that our stranger is a protective stranger, artfully protecting the human dwelling place as a medicine man. In fact, our root vr gives us another related word, Vrindavana, the medicinal grove, the grove of the stranger. Thus, with our Sprach Melarai, we have unwittingly stumbled upon the sacred grove with our rationality. Now, whether we are its guests or its hosts depends entirely on whether the muses choose to hold their suitor by the arm in marriage. The word guest and hostile both come from the root bearing the sense of stranger, host, guest, and enemy, and gives us the Sanskrit root which means to laugh and to smile. The word host and keeper both come from a root bearing the sense of owner, master, host, and husband, and gives us the Sanskrit root pati. When we combine these roots, we obtain a very ancient term that means keeper of guests, and from which we get our modern word hospital, which we named as Vrindavana, the stranger's sanctuary. Recalling from an earlier lecture, 
when the stranger of the grove bids thee drink and farewell, we can say with absolute certainty that the Zugma was hospitable. And we expect nothing less from our Arya Yogeshwara. So when Stahl says, the discovery and creation of sacred language was in all respects a highly specialized enterprise, I'd like for us to become extremely pedantic with our articulations in language. Agreed, there is nothing more annoying than someone stumbling upon the words they themselves utter. But when it comes to sacred language, we ensure things are precise. Otherwise, we risk turning the keeper of guests into a host of hostilities. Though many passages in the Rig Veda refer to the process of sacred composition of the Riks, others hint at the creation of origin of language itself. Both events were conceived of in similar terms. It would take us too far to try to decide whether such a similarity makes sense, though I shall return to it in the epilogue. But it is tempting to think so, and to assume that the seers had knowledge of events to which we do not ordinarily have direct access. It is not wise to ascribe to the facile assumption that the people we study know at most what we know ourselves. Stahl here speaks on the origin of language, which we saw partially in the motif of Brahma pouring Brahman, that is himself as Om, the syllable upon which all else rests. The Rishis will have much to say about the pouring, and we will become acquainted with their visions in the grove. But to do so, we must become comfortable with Sprach Melarai. So using our midspace root, Vr, let's invoke Varuna with the help of Rishi Nabhaka and see how the twilight, the navel, and the cave preserves midspace imagery. Nabhaka says, Who is the upholder of the worlds who knows the secret names of Vradi, their hidden names? He is a poet who fosters the many poetic arts, as heaven does its form. Let all other squirts burst. A few slides back, I had mentioned that as we study Brahman, dawn will reappear in many guises. Rishi Nabhaka is making an explicit reference to this here with the word Usra, which we saw comes from the root Vas and gives us Ushas, dawn. Now in this hymn, the phrase Nabanta Manyake Same, let all other squirts burst, as Stephanie and Joel put it, is repeated at the end of each verse, and is certainly a play on word of the poet's own name, Nabhaka, since they both come from the same root, meaning to burst asunder, be torn, and injure. The word for navel is Nabhya, and comes from this root. And we can recall from another hymn that this is the site from which our midspace emerges, Nabhya Asi Dantariksham. Thus it is no coincidence that a hymn to Varuna invokes the imagery of both dawn and the navel, all bearing the semantics of the middle, the twilight zone. Speaking of Antariksha, it is a word composed of two roots, of which the first we've seen before. It had given us the words in and inter, thus antar in Sanskrit, meaning within, between, and amongst. This between and betwixt imagery reminds me of Dvaipayana, the dwelling in between. Dvaipayana consists of two words, dvaipa and ayana. Dvaipa means relating to between bodies of water, for example an island, and belonging to a tiger. A synonym of tiger is guhashaya, which means cave dwelling. And this word comes from the root guh, a hiding or secret place, a cave, den, lair, or cavity. And Rishi Nabhaka, invoking the midspace, was not shy to bring up the cavern of secrets. Ayana, a place, site, or abode, a place of resort, course, or procession. Thus, Dvaipayana is an abode between the two bodies of water, an island. And the Mahabharata gives this name to Krishna Dvaipayana, or Vyasa, who is said to have gained access to the grove, Namisharanya. We will cultivate these sets of poetics later. Let's see how the poet is linked up with the stranger sanctuary. We saw a few lectures back that the Sanskrit word for poet is Gavi, 
and was an extension of a root that gave us the English word sky. Unsurprisingly, the image of the cave is preserved in the word guharam, thus preserving for us the sense that the kavi is guhashaya, or cave dwelling. Invoking the hollow vessel within which the drops of soma are poured, we can map the activity of the kavi to the vessel. Thus Brahma pours Brahman into the kavi's vessel, his heart, wherein the eternal syllable reverberates and resounds. In the same way we saw that the root vas was juxtaposed to the root vish as a poetic device. Through altering the final sibilant of the root vas, we can juxtapose it with the root vash. Now vash carries the sense to desire, to long for, seek, will, and command, and gives us the root vash, will, desire, tamed, and humbled, control, power, dominion. And it also gives us the word vashi, fascinating, bewitching, and subjugation, from which we get the word ushanas, the subjugator, who is shukra, the teacher of the asuras. As we will see later, dawn is to be desired, and all our desires are covered with fascinating and bewitching auras, imagery that is typical of the mid-space, where the battles with Ushanas, the subjugating stranger, the artist, occur. And the Kavi is explicitly linked with this mid-space imagery in a verse of the Gita, where Krishna speaks of the Vrishnis, I am Vasudeva, of the Pandavas, I am Dhananjaya, of the sages, Vyasa, of poets, I am Ushana. Now with the invocation of these words, we see Krishna, Arjuna, together in the middle of the battlefield, from the mind of the Muni Vyasa, being noted down by our Brahmanaspati, our Ganapati, Kavim Kavina Mupamashravastamam, our Marut of the midspace. It is this recursive nature of Brahman to preserve through symbolic artisanship the imagery of the sacrifice in its words and verbs that Stahl believes is metalinguistic. And we here are on a journey to partake in these metalinguistic visions. No doubt these visions sprouting from the navel of Vyasa permit all other squirts to burst, for it is in the nature of Brahma to eternally pour the effect of which is the growth, increase, and expansion of the navel of the earth, the ground of poesy. The Vratyas have much to teach about the origin of sense, imagination, intellect, and language, for they are our medicine men, whose samadhi affords them ruddy red cows and bulls. Isolated terms and expressions give less insight into these ideas than such hymns as Rig Veda 1071. In this hymn, later known as the Hymn of Wisdom, Jnana, Brihaspati is invoked as Brahmanaspati, the Lord of Brahman, the power of language. The medieval commentator Sayana says, When Brihaspati saw that the boys had understood the meaning of the Veda, he recited this hymn, smiling and addressing himself. In the verses 7 to 8 of the hymn, there's an untranslatable play on the words hrada, pond, and hrid, heart. The final verse refers to the four main priests of the sacrifice, the hotar, invoker, who recites the mantras of the Rigveda, the udgatra, the chanter, who sings the samans of the Samaveda, the brahman, president, attached to the Atharvaveda, who controls the sacrifice, and the Advaryu, the servant, attached to the Yajurveda, who performs the ritual acts and who in due course became the manager of the ritual. Two lectures ago, I claimed that Chitta could be translated as grove, heart, and pond. Here, Stahl has brought up the wordplay between heart and pond. The etymological root of the word heart and cardiac in discord gives us the Sanskrit hrid, meaning heart, mind, breast, and chest, giving us hridaya and cardia. Interestingly, our English word greet comes from a root meaning to sound, groan, weep, cry, roar, scold, and address, from which we get the Sanskrit hrada to make noise, sound, a deep lake or pond, and hrad meaning to sound and roar, from which we get hlad 
meaning to sound, make a cry of joy, to rejoice, delight, exhilarate, and gladden. Thus we can see sound imagery re-emerge in the word for pond. And to speak from the heart is not a foreign expression. The composition of the hymns of the Rig Veda was clearly regarded as a very special kind of cooperative activity. It is not surprising that a specialized vocabulary developed in order to refer to its many special features. It is significant in the present context that the first technical vocabulary which we find in the Indian culture is this technical vocabulary evolved in the Rig Veda in order to refer to itself and to its own composition through what is basically a metalinguistic process of self-reference. The other technical vocabulary found in the Rig Veda is the vocabulary of the ritual. As we have already seen, this vocabulary is related to the vocabulary of sacred composition. The ritual is referred to in connection with it as in Rig Veda 1071. The root Pu refers to the filtering and purification of thought, of language, and of the Soma juice. Other terms are similarly meaningful on different levels. The term Grita denotes the clarified butter of the ritual libations, the ghee of Indian English, but it also refers to the creative imagination of the seers and poets. Many more specialized ritual terms occur already in the Rig Veda. The sacrificial ladle, Juhu, is related to Jiva, language, sometimes called a Guhya Jiva, hidden language. The hymns chanted in the sacrifice are called Ukta, their mode of recitation during the Soma sacrifice, Shastra. Commands, generally given by the Advaryu to the other priests, are called Presha. Among the ritual formulas, the exclamation Vaushat, to which I shall return, is referred to by the means of the expression Vashat Krita. A large number of special technical terms refers to the specific priests, rites, altars, oblations, and vessels. Some of these are retained in the classical ritual of later times, others disappear, are modified, or change meaning. The three pressings of the Soma, in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, are also referred to. The chants of the Samaveda are described together with many of the complex special features. The Dakshina, or sacrificial fee, also occurs in the Rig Veda. Now there's a lot that Stahl has presented here, and we will map every single one of these terms onto that ritual to make sense of why it's named the way it's named. And next lecture, we'll further develop the relation between linguistic terminology and ritual symbolism, and begin to hint at that link between pouring, purifying, and that guhya jiva, that hidden language. For now, we offer our obeisance to the stranger who has kept us united to the grove with his cord. Namami shwaram satchidananda rupam. Kariya priya ay, namunan kalila ay, tibayat.